said, I'll be talking about the types of undergraduate research that go on in university. So just a little bit about me before I start. Uh, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Is there any other Texans in here? Got a couple in the back, all right. Um, like you said, I'm a space physics junior. Uh, I'm also getting a minor in mathematics. I'm the president of the Society of Physics Students here on campus. So for you space physicists, I'll be seeing you a lot. The, I'm also currently involved in multiple areas of research. Um, involved in radio astronomy, where I'm using the Hera telescope, which we're building on campus to investigate the origins and structure of the universe. And what we're talking about today is the electric rocket propulsion project I'm working on, where we're using uh, an arc jet thruster system, which I'll describe here in a second. So before I talk about that, just what is electric propulsion anyways? Right? This isn't your typical chemical rocket you're used to seeing, but the textbook definition is this jumble of words, but what it really simplifies down to is you're injecting some sort of propellant into a chamber and heating it with electric power and then shooting out the back. So simple enough to begin with, right? So uh, why do we care about this? Why not just use typical chemical rockets? Well, really we, we care about how efficient you can use your propellant mass because the more you want to send up, the more fuel you got to use to get it there. So if you can send less propellant mass up into space, that's less money spent on rocket fuel, which is more dollar signs than these aerospace companies. So they like that whenever you're, whenever you're more efficient with the dollar spent. So this, these types of systems are not the kind you can use to get off the surface of the Earth into orbit because they're too low thrust. These are the types of systems that you would use once you're already placed into orbit by the typical rockets you're used to seeing. And these are usually used for keeping satellites in orbit because there's some drag that you get when you're in low Earth orbit and, and you have to make corrections for that. It can also be used for station keeping where communication satellites have to be in touch with the ground station tower for that to meet minor attitude adjustments. And there are also the types of systems you have to use if you're going to go to deep space exploration for uh, the outer solar system and stuff where the, the velocity changes you need are so high that you can't achieve them without a huge amount of, of fuel from these traditional chemical rockets. So you can achieve higher DOS velocities with these types of systems. So just for the comparison in the amount of fuel you're using with these two different systems, on the left here is the, the typical rocket you're used to seeing, right? It's the large vertical uh, tower of fuel mostly, and then you've got these large amount of thrust coming at the bottom, but what the amount of fuel you're actually using here every second equates to about that of a Chevy Tahoe. So you're just chunking out enormous amounts of mass. Every, this is every second. That's an enormous amount of mass to be ejecting, which is why you have to have such a large fuel tank. So, in comparison, the system that we're using, this is, this is my arc jet here, we use about, about two pennies worth of mass every second. So, huge differences in the amount, in the amount of uh, mass that you, have to, that you have to use, and getting a bunch of pennies up into space is a lot easier than getting a whole lot of Chevy Tahoe's. <laughs> so, um, we kind of like it for that reason. So, um, the kind of thruster that we're using in this arc jet is, is called an electrothermal thruster, where essentially you're just applying heat via electricity to heat up your propellant gas and then expand it throughout the nozzle. So uh, this arc jet is essentially just a plasma discharge, which you pass through your propellant gas to heat it up. And then after it's been heated, it tends to expand, right? The pressure goes up. And when you expand that out of the nozzle, you get a high exhaust velocity giving you a small but non negligible amount of thrust. So, this plasma discharge is not something you're all familiar with because you've all seen this fun household toy, which, though the power levels are not quite the same we use for propulsion, it's the same basic principle. So, another uh, type of plasma discharge you're all familiar with is lightning. And the temperatures that you get with lightning are actually not, are something you would see with an arc jet thruster where the temperature of this plasma arc can be about the temperature of the sun or hotter. And that is why we like to use a heat up repellent because you can get it that hot. So uh, this is my team working on the ArcJet project. This is in the space systems lab here on campus. Um, so in previous semesters, the ArcJet projects had been uh, worked on kind of on and off and due to just equipment constraints and stuff, they never really had it able to fire for longer than 10 to 30 seconds. And this semester, thanks to Embry-Riddle's Undergraduate Research Institute, we've been able to get funding and use of this facilities to get a better vacuum pump and a, 
a meter that controls the amount of propellant flow that we're using so we have a more stable system and the conditions are much more suitable for extended operations. So we were actually able to fire our jet for a uh, longer period of time here. So I'll show you a video of what we actually achieved on the first day of the undergraduate research uh, funding. So you can see we've actually got a, a stable thrust going here. This was sustained for 30 minutes as compared to the original you know, 30 seconds. So this was a, a groundbreaking uh, day for us in, in the ArcJet project. Um, and you can see there's the plasma discharge. You can kind of see some of the, the coloration from the ionization of the propellant gas. But uh, we were very excited about that. So some of the current issues we're trying to work through now are the power you use to, to supply this, this arc, this plasma discharge. We're limited right now to about 40 to 90 watts where the typical uh, thrust you see in industry for most conventional satellite systems are about a kilowatt of power. The thruster is about, some, in some cases, 10 to 30 times weaker in the watts you're using. Um, but it's actually a good thing because we're, we're studying systems that, have, that are not really in, uh, have been researched before. They're so low power that there's not a whole lot of information that's out there about these kinds of low power systems. So we're contributing new data to this field. So uh, another issue we have right now is that the, the current design was, was built uh, by a team in, in years past that really only designed to be a prototype, but since they could never get it to fire for a long amount of time, they never went to the next iteration of design. So we're working with that initial design, to try, and now that we've got it to work, we're working on remodeling for a new design so that we have a converging nozzle section, which all that propellant gets flowed into, it, drives up pressure and heat, and we like that. And we expanded it through a nozzle at the back, get some thrust, and, uh, and that's what we're, like I said, we're currently working on the redesign version of the nozzle now. Uh, we're also coming up on our first measurements here in the next week or so of the thrust measurements from this small thruster. We're imagining uh, on a, a good basis, we might get about a newton of course, so it's about the weight of an apple. Uh, some of the thruster systems you see can be as low as uh, the weight of a sheet of paper in your hand. So you don't, you don't imagine like, oh, that's something I would like as a, a rocket thruster system, but if you were to apply that amount of thrust for months to a year, which some of these systems do, you, you get going pretty quick, uh, faster than actually pretty much any chemical rocket can get you going. So uh, then in the fall semester, we're going to be trying to get another session of the undergraduate research funding. And we will be applying an external magnetic field uh, to the thruster nozzle section so that we can control these ionized particles that are leaving the thruster and try and condense that plume and focus it better for better thrust results. And also that what that helps with is, since this is such a hot plasma gas, since it heats your propellant so much, that some of the materials you use for your nozzle may get overheated and start to deform or, or melt in some cases. So if you can constrain that, that exhaust flow with the magnetic field, it's not actually touching any part of your nozzle. So you're not limited by the temperature of your, your exhaust stream. So that, that's something we're looking to do in the fall, and that'll be a, a longer term project. These are systems that are, that are highly advanced and, and can be pretty complex. So just to, for reference as to how these systems are used in industry and the relevance of the project, all these, these satellites you see that are in white font, now you can't really read the names of these satellites, but you can see the, the white font here in the center, those are all ArcJet systems on current satellites in space. And then, of course, this is all electric propulsion uh, satellites, so it's a very uh, useful system that a lot of satellite companies are employing because, like I said, your, your satellite orbital starts to decay, and if you've only got a lifetime of a satellite that's five years or so, that costs about ten, tens of millions of dollars to launch into space just to get a communication satellite up there. So if you have to launch another satellite after five years for another ten million dollars, or you could just put an ArcJet on it, which would be significantly cheaper, and extend the lifetime by three to five years, you could potentially double the life of your spacecraft, depending on how much propellant you send up there. That spends a lot of dollars and cents to these, these companies, so it's a, a very valuable system to add to your, to your satellite. Any questions there? What is the uh, propulsion material? What do you use? What is that? The propellant gas? Yeah. The fuel. The fuel we're using right now is nitrogen because uh, it's the safest to work with. Typical 
uh, industry rockets use a, a, a composition of gases, which is hydrazine, but that's a highly toxic gas that uh, student researchers uh, having that in a lab right here would be a bit dangerous. So uh, it can be very toxic to touch by people. So nitrogen works very well, especially for this first generation of products. So, any other questions? Well, it's like on Earth, where